Okay, good evening everybody. Uh, we are recording, which is excellent. Hello and welcome to this evening's Careering Ahead. I'm Naya Mimella, um, I'm a vet at the BHA and a podcaster and I sit on the Committee for Women in Racing. So thank you so much for joining us again. Um, we are continuing with our Careering Ahead series, which is a wonderful group of interviewees that we've collated from within the racing industry. Um, you can find all the previous interviews on our website if you just look in the resource section. They are also on YouTube if you fancy heading over there. We've previously had Amy Murphy, Anna Marie Phelps, Salika Barma. There's been heaps on there over the winter. Um, we've been trying to bring you as many conversations as we can with women from within the industry to keep things ticking over during COVID until, as the Queen said, we can meet again, uh, which we are hoping is going to be this summer. Um, there are some events coming up there. Is, um, the AGM is going to be coming up in May, and we are planning a few further events later in the year. We are really, really hoping to get together at some point because it's obviously been a very long time since we've been able to see any of our members. Um, but yes, do watch the website. There will be emails coming out on the mailing list as well. And I know Tallulah has got lots of things up her sleeve. So yes, thank you so much for joining us. And I am joined tonight by somebody who needs very little introduction, but I'm going to give her one anyway, um, which is Maggie Carver, who is the chair of the Racecourse Association and she sits on the board at the BHA as well. She has had an amazing career. I'm really, really excited to talk to her this evening. Very um, humbled that she has said that she'll do an interview with us because um, Maggie doesn't do interviews very often. So uh, we're really fortunate to have her. Um, she is also warming us up for next week when I am going to be chatting to Julie Harrington, the new chair of the BHA, who Maggie helped to appoint. And um, she's going to be here at 6pm next Tuesday. So same time next week, um, Julie is going to be here, which I know is going to also be a great chat um so she's coming on board but yes thank you maggie so much for joining us it's really lovely to have really lovely to have you um as i said maggie is uh, the current chair of the rca but she has been a chair of many 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 boards as well as having a stellar career in business and we're going to be chatting quite a lot about that we were just having a lovely chat before we opened about the wonderful japanese kimonos behind maggie as well she did live in japan and we're going to touch on that at some point during the evening um as usual the q a box and the chat box are open so do put your questions in i will be monitoring those during the course of the evening um, if you've got any burning questions to ask Maggie, just pop them in there um, and we will pose them either in the middle of the conversation or we'll do a bit of a Q&A at the end. So do you stick your questions in because I know there'll be lots of things that people want to ask. So let Maggie, let's kick off. Um, so you were born and raised in Sutton on Hull in Yorkshire, Maggie. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your early life and your education and, and what you were into when you were young? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for a, a, a stellar introduction, which I don't think I really... Um... <laughs> Properly deserved, but anyway, I'll start in Beverly. Sutton on Tom Hall was the was I think the last uh, post of the Beverly district, and we moved to Beverly very quickly after I was born. And so I was born and bred in Beverly. Basically, went to school there. Um, I had two major interests when I was at school. One was music, and the other was sport. I did any sport um, and did an awful lot of music. Loved dancing as well. I also learnt um, to ride and used to ride my uh, friend's pony on Beverly Westwood there. So um, early introduction to racing. Um, my mother used to take us to picnics um, and we'd sit by the railings and watch the horses go by at a great rate. And it is a magnificent sight. It still is a magnificent sight. <laughs> so and gives me a thrill. Uh, to this day. So that was my early introduction to racing. So I really just simply born and bred in Beverly um, and educated down. And were your parents involved in racing or did they just have a passion for the sport themselves? No, I mean, my parents, my, my mother was an environmentalist and my father an architectural historian. So um, they weren't really um, involved in racing. I think my mother rode originally. There is some family background in, um, in racing. I've got, I'm um, related to the um, gentleman that um, built and owned Belmont Park in the US and oh, wow. also in Japan um, and, and Hong Kong, the members of the family have been breeders and owners and jockeys and on various things. So I have got a little bit of a background in racing, but it's a, a, a while back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you were so super musical. Um, I, I know you were a very accomplished flautist, Maggie, and you played with um, 
the flosses from the BBC Symphony Orchestra. Did you ever think about pursuing a career in music or was that not really on your agenda when you were growing up? Yes, I definitely did. Um, when I was 16, I had a scholarship, a music, county music scholarship, and I went down to London uh, for lessons with um, David Buck, who was principal flautist of the BBC Symphony Orchestra and uh, professor at the Royal College. And um, my mother and I went down and said, should I be a flute player um, in, as my career? And he said, um, well, I say the same to everybody. You should only be a musician if you can't do anything else. And I think he meant that, you know, not, not that you simply can't do anything else, but that your passion is so great that you can't do anything else. Okay. Um, and uh, I, I, my, I felt that I was probably going to be a second flute player for the rest of my life. And I wanted a bit more than that. So um, decided to study sciences instead. So that was a pivotal moment, I think, in my career. Definitely. And quite an unusual combination to be, I mean, often scientists and mathematicians are very good at music, but, you know, having that kind of very artistic, creative, musical element, along with obviously a very strong grounding in science. Um, did you, you went to study biochemistry at Oxford. How did you pick that? Was that just sort of where your passions lay that you chose to pursue that path? Um, I think I come from a very highly medical background and um, so you know the things that I've done tend to have been things that I've been aware of before and um, I actually felt that my passion for music was so great that I couldn't be a doctor because I, there were so many doctors in my family and they were all terribly passionate about medicine couldn't do anything else all day and I thought I had to do a bit of music in my life and so that's why I am um, why I picked biochemistry because I thought I could do medical research at the, at the same time as playing my music. Oh, wonderful. And so you had a phenomenal time at, at Oxford by the sounds of things and um, and you found your husband at Oxford as well, which is really, yes. <laughs> really wonderful. <laughs> and, and your career then started off into investment banking, which is, um, you know, quite a, I imagine back then was quite a male world. Um, how did you choose that as your kind of first step on the career ladder, Maggie? What drew you into the world of finance and the kind of, it's quite a fast paced, um, you know, very fast and furious lifestyle in investment banking? Yes. Um, well, it's quite an interesting one in, in some senses in that um, I had a, a kind of mentor in um Lord Moser, Klaus Moser, who was at Wadham College, um, the warden of Wadham uh, in my day. And when I got some jobs on offer, I went to see him and I said, I've got these various jobs. And what do you think? And he said, well, I would take the investment bank because you can go, you can manage your career quite quickly. It's, it's quite a quick ladder up. You're salary will go up and it's a great way of looking at businesses a lot of this different businesses learning about that and then your options will be open for the next step um turned out i think to be quite a good piece of advice and uh you know investment <laughs> banking life was fast and furious um i learned an awful lot about finance and and also about um how to deal with people and customers and so forth so it was a very useful start actually so, what, so for those of us that aren't um, knowledgeable about the internal workings of investment banking, what sort of things do you actually, would you actually have been doing in the early days starting there, Maggie? Okay. Um, well, the bank that I, I um, joined, they, they had a sort of cook store to start off with. They put you in one place for a year and then another place for a year, and then you settled after that. So the first thing I did was, um, because I was the only person that had learned how to use computers by then and how to code, because I had extra lessons um, when I was at college because I thought computers were going to be the next thing. So I learned about computers and had extra There's no flies on you, Maggie, are there? I'm coding. So <laughs> I got the first computer at Warburg's and, um, and, and so I sort of, it's horrendous to say, I think that, isn't it now? But um, I was in the development of new products and we took products from America and repurposed them for Europe and then I wrote the, the models for computing interest and things like that. Um, and then did some of the marketing for the new products, some things called medium term notes and things. So that was my first year. My second year was in Japan as an equity analyst, um, which was a fantastic opportunity. Um, loved 
every minute. And then I settled in corporate finance after that. And, and life in Japan, you and I just touched on that before we started this, but it sounds like a fabulous opportunity. Had you always wanted to sort of work and travel and, and explore as part of your working life? Or was that a bit of a surprise to you when that came up? Um, I think I had wanted a bit of excitement and it was an opportunity I, I just couldn't say no to. And it was a completely new environment. I mean, you touched on the fact that investment banking is a very male environment. It was a very male environment. Even when I settled in corporate finance, I think there were six women out of 120. Um, going, going to Japan was even more of a male environment uh, for executives. Mm -hmm. I was the only um, one of very, very few women executives. Um, and there were lots of funny things that I had to get used to. Like, for example, you know, men expect you to open the doors and you to carry their bags and um, <laughs> so lots of, you know, you to sort of wait behind as they go into the lift. Um, so quite difficult for an executive um, to, to work out there, but um, very, very interesting. And how did you um, how did you sort of tolerate that as somebody who um, was obviously you know highly intelligent had been very successful to that point and subsequently, um, you know as somebody who I'm we you know all about women having equal opportunities would find that I think really hard actually to to tolerate that kind of I know it's like it's a cultural difference isn't it but how did you kind of settle into that and and become used to it I suppose yes it is about respecting people other people's mm -hmm. culture. Um, and I, I very much did. I, I'd actually um, bothered to learn a bit of Japanese before I went out. I'd read a lot of books about it. Um, so it wasn't, um, it wasn't a, a big shock to me when I went out there. And um, I do think that was important to respect people's culture. I did have some problems sometimes. I, I was, a, as an analyst, I went to see companies with my, with my translator. And I'd say something that's by a direct question, being a sort of Yorkshire last something like how much profit do you make which is a nice simple question isn't it and they found that very difficult to answer because they're not good at answering questions directly like that and so they wouldn't answer it properly i just say so how much profit do you make <laughs> they, couldn't, they just couldn't cope with that they started sweating and i was as tall as them anyways <laughs> could be quite difficult but i was once in a queue um, of people, of, of women, um, quite a long queue, maybe 20 women getting my lunch. And a man walked straight up to the top of the queue. And of course, I understood by then that that was normal. Um, but I did actually have the, the woman in front of me and the woman behind me actually apologise for that. So yes. they, they were also culturally aware of the difference in the West. It's really interesting. It's fascinating, isn't it? And, you know, having lived and worked abroad myself, I find it, um, I, I think it's an amazing opportunity if people can uh, take that up and, and particularly somewhere that is as culturally different as Japan just sounds. God, I could talk to you about that all night, Maggie, but we should move on. Um, <laughs> so after that, you went on to work for Clive Hollick, which was your sort of first venture into television and the media. Do you want to talk us a little bit about that move and the opportunities that that opened up for you, Maggie, after that? Yes. Well, I, I wasn't actually looking for a job um, at that stage. I was quite happily in corporate finance, but um, a friend of mine who worked at Bain, he just said to me, there's this great job working for, you know, somebody who's highly regarded. Um, and a lot of people, my, my colleagues at Bain are going for it, but I think you'd like it. And um, at that stage in investment banking, the interest rates were backing up and um, the, the kind of big, transactions were drying up. There were a lot of uh, sort of trade sales and things. So it was just, there was a bit of a lull in activity. And I, I just thought, well, why not, you know, have a go. And I applied and about 10 days later, I was offered the job. And I, that was a bit of a shock actually. <laughs> I thought, what do I do now? Um, uh, but I decided to take it and um, it turned out to be a very exciting um, thing to have done because we were awarded the franchise for Meridian Television in the South and Southeast, which meant starting a television company from scratch. And so to be involved in that was a great privilege. Mm. And so from there, um, after, after working with Clive, you, you started to be placed onto boards at that point. 
how did and and you've then described yourself as having a, what was known as a portfolio career where you have uh, are working with many different companies doing lots of different things um how did that come about and how did you kind of rationalize the move out of a I mean, what we would all see is like a sort of steady nine to five with one role, you know, where you've got all your ducks in a bit of a row or hopefully. Um, how did you kind of start to balance all of those different positions and, and take on new things like that? So my first non-executive role was with a, actually a, a, a large French PLC. From the <laughs> At the age of 27, it was probably not what I was expecting to do, but um, that came with the role with Lord Hollick, and it was one of the opportunities that I rather look forward to. Um, okay. He, I also acted as his um, alternate on the board in a, on the board of SIS and one or two other companies. So that introduced me to non-executive work, and um, so that so initially it was always part of the role. Um, then when I went on to three and four, which was the Channel Four Racing um, and outside broadcasting role. Um, I, I think I kept the SIS role um, going, and, um, and and so I hit a fork in the road actually um, when my children were small. Um, one of them was just a baby, and um, had a lot of family tragedy. Um, my mother died, and my grandmother died. My uncle died. My sister nearly died, all within one year. Um, that that sort of came together with me moving on to a, uh, or, or um, being about to move on to a finance role, but much bigger company. And I had an ambition to just keep going on bigger and bigger and bigger chief executive roles. Um, but with all the sort of um, running, you know, my mother's estate, my grandmother's estate and tr trying to help my father through repairing his house, <laughs> having to, children, one of them, a baby who was still suckling and my husband away a lot. It was, it just became an overwhelming amount to deal with. Mm. And um, I, I actually sort of virtually collapsed. I, I, I had a, an illness, which was a bit like long COVID, fun enough. It was uh, also catalyzed by a virus um, and ended up with me just completely out of energy and totally and utterly out of energy. And as I emerged from that, I had a permanent, my husband thinks <laughs> probably about 20% reduction, permanent reduction in my energy levels. Okay. Um, which really meant that I still need nine hours sleep, for example, you know, now, but um, it really meant that I had to make some choices if I wanted to stay as a chief executive. And by the way, I've never done a nine to five rule. <laughs> <laughs> I've always done much longer hours than that. Um, then I really probably wouldn't have the time to see my children at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the idea emerged that I would carry on with my non-executive work, which would give me the, the flexibility to work from home, to, to be with the children, and that my husband and I would buy a business as well. So I could keep my bit of my hand in the executive um, business running role. And so that's how we work things. Um, and, you know, it's worked for me, although there's, you know, quite a lot of downside. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of upside for women working in, in non-executive roles because they have responsibility and they're interesting. Um, and you can work from home very easily um, and sort your dates out around your family. Those are all really huge perks, but... Mm. Um, I think on the other side, it's not particularly well paid. It's also doesn't have a pension with it. And every few years you have to find new roles. Um, so, you know, there are upsides and downsides, but I, I was able, to, uh, you know, to, to manage a career that way, as well as, um, you know, bring the family, bring up my girls. Mm. Well, thank you very much for your honesty on that, Maggie, because I think for someone who reads your CV from the outside, you know, it, you have done a lot, you have been with a lot of huge companies and had a lot of big roles and actually it sometimes appears from the outside that these women like you look like you've got it all and actually to to hear the kind of honest appraisal of actually it's not that easy and I couldn't do it and I was you know you were sick and and, and actually having to make those choices I think is actually really important for people to hear because it shows that you can still achieve 
as much as you have, which is an incredible amount, <laughs> um, without, but whilst accepting that there have to be some sacrifices. And um, yeah, thank you, thank you for that. Um, and you know, as we've been talking about, you've mentioned your daughters a couple of times. Um, everyone on this call will know that um, the Racing Home Project is still ongoing with women in racing. Um, and we're talking quite a lot at the moment about working mothers in the industry. Um, we talk a lot about the juggle and, and childcare and balancing all of that. How did you go about rationalising your career and motherhood at the same time, Maggie? Well, I think you've got some of the hints there um, from my, my what I've said previously. Um, and, uh, you know, I've always said actually to any sort of senior women that they need, if they've got families, they need to, to, to lead and show that they can take time off. I've always said to them that if they don't do it, then nobody else underneath them can. Mm. So I'm a very big believer. I, I always say to people, if, if, if I'm worried about your productivity or what you, you know, what you put out as a result of taking time off, I will tell you. And I've never, ever found a woman who has <laughs> actually... <laughs> So in any kind of, you know, diminution in productivity as a, as a result of the juggle, you know, and it is a juggle. Um, we all have to do that. But um, I, I do think that we've, we've got to understand, I mean, you know, we have Holly um, from the RCA uh, who has a family and I think she does a wonderful job the way, she, I mean, she's, the output is phenomenal and she has a family. And, you know, actually, there are so many wonderful examples, I think, in racing and elsewhere of women that have managed to, to juggle, but just don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. It's, um, I mean, I remember when I was in merchant banking that investment banking, if you like that, um, I, I couldn't have put a picture of my family, you know, on the, on my table, but, but a man could because <laughs> there he was caring and loving and, and for a woman, it was kind of, that's your priority. So you haven't got, you know, a working priority. I think that attitudes have changed now. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm also, I'd like to say, I'm very, very optimistic about what COVID has brought for women because we now know that, um, you know, it is possible to work from home. It is possible to keep oneself in touch. And um, the kind of thing, when I, when I had a family, I was a, a chief executive and, you know, as a, as a person where, who has to make the decisions and where the buck stops, very difficult to take time off. But I'm, I'm you know, I had two weeks, two weeks for my first daughter and, and three for the second. Just you know, grief. Um, and, and it's very difficult to take time off. But I think now it's much going to be much, much easier because people can't, we know that you can keep in touch so much more easily and you can be, able, you can meet, you know, be, do those kind of roles. So I think, you know, that the sort of, the kind of things that I've done, the kind of sacrifices I've made in terms of um, non-executive work and all of that and not keeping on the, on the executive ladder, I think women are going to have a lot more choices now mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I'm super excited about that. It's really great. It's really mm. great. And you've mentioned Holly there and um, Caroline's on this call as well, actually. Um, you've got a fabulous team around you at the RCA. Um, and I know you are well renowned for mentoring um, other women beneath you and, and really kind of pulling up others with you. Um, how has mentoring played a role in your career? And obviously transitioning from being a very male dominated industries in finance, what has been the importance of mentors to you, Maggie? And, and how have you found them as you've gone along the way? Um, I have to say that, it's, I mean, in uh, Klaus Moser's case, I actually wrote to him <laughs> just as a sort of complete, uh, one of my friends who was at Wadham um, said, oh, I, th I think you'll, you'll get on with Klaus Moser, similar interests and all the rest. And I, and I just wrote um, the other ones I've sort of come across, um, uh, Andrew Stuart Roberts, for example, at uh, the investment bank. Uh, he he just took an interest. We had music in common again, like Klaus Moser, um, Lord Hollick uh, at MAI at uh, and United Business Media. He's always taken a very kind interest, and I just kept in touch. Um, so I've been lucky um, to have people who've just taken an interest and wanted to to mentor me. And in terms of going the other way around, I've taken an interest in in women and, and making sure that senior women, you know, have 
have the confidence to go for things and and try to encourage them. One of the big things I felt is that they lack confidence. Mm. Um, and there are so many capable women. And by the way, there are masses of them in racing, you know, <laughs> on the race course side. Incredible, incredible women. Um, and I just think I would just encourage them to go for things because mm. and have confidence. Mm. Definitely, it's, it's good advice. Definitely good advice. And I, you were saying you've been lucky, but I think, you know, with the, the example of, for example, writing to Franz Maser, it's a bit fortune favours the brave, isn't it, sometimes, and that, that actually reaching out to people and asking, I think, is, is a key thing for people to, to have the confidence to do and be brave to do that. Yes, you know, definitely. Yes. What's the downside? You know. Well, yes, I always think that. I, I increasingly think with age, what's the worst they can say? Well, it's no, isn't it? You know, um, so once you get to grips with that, it's kind of OK. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I think also non-executive um, work does actually get you used to failure because you have to, you know, put yourself in for quite a few things before you actually get get on the thing so um, and how do you deal with failures Maggie you know we often talk about kind of picking yourself up and dusting yourself off are you a big believer in taking the positives out of failure or what's your kind of attitude totally to yeah I mean I just dust myself down and pick myself up again <laughs> carry on <laughs> that's it you know have confidence in yourself and um you you just never know I mean when when it comes to jobs you really at the end of the day, I often don't know what people are looking for. That people give you a bit more feedback nowadays, but um, you know, it can be that they're just looking for something completely different or some different sets of skills, or they have a different strategy. Um, and so, I just think go for things, and and the ex just the experience of of doing it is is a, is it helpful. Definitely, definitely. And um, just going back to the, um, the your work on boards and obviously, you know, talking about bringing up other women with you. Um, are you, the rate of um, pace of women being uh, admitted onto boards has been glacial, perhaps <laughs> it's not no, an understatement. Yeah. And obviously we've had the 30% club around for a while and there's lots of efforts in terms of kind of getting women on boards. Are you hopeful for the future, Maggie? And what do you sort of see in terms of the progression of, of that side of things? Yeah, I'm really hopeful, actually. Um, I think, you know, when I started, I was 27, I think, when I had my first non-executive directorship, which is quite young. Which is young. very young. Um, That's massively young. And all the boards I was on, you know, were full of people over 50, over 60, or even over 70. Um, mm -hmm. So there was a sort of massive 30-year gap between me and the next person often. Um, and I, I, I thought, remember thinking then, you know, by the time I reach 50, this will all have changed. And then and I reach 50 and it hasn't changed as much as I, as I thought. But if you look at the 30% club, it's taken 10 years, but it has got there. Mm -hmm. um, I really think now that a lot of women are having the kind of career that does make them much more eligible for the board roles. Um, so I think that there's... I really think now that things are changing, we've got to look more broadly because women are, you know, making their own careers now in non-executive work, but we need to have other types of diversity mm -hmm. at the board. And so I think we're looking more broadly now at, uh, you know, ethnic diversity and also background, uh, diversity of background, I think, um, to help. And they all do help. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's difficult to get the right combination of experience. But I, mm. I, I think um, women have helped. Um, and I think it, I really think that we're on the way now. Mm. And if somebody was thinking about the possibility of um, going for a board position, what sort of skills do you think? I know, obviously, it's difficult to speak in general terms because different positions are different, aren't they? But what do you think in general, though, are the kind of things that will help you to be ready, I guess, for applying for board positions, Maggie? Um, I think that, uh, anything that gives you committee um, experience is a good thing. Um, if you can chair a committee, that's also a good thing. Um, the way, and, and of course, most people have been on one committee or another, haven't they? And uh, I think just start there. And then, you know, again, have the confidence um, and then get to know people. I, I mean, I'm not a great person for sort of networking generally, but the way that my career has been built is really been built on knowing people in boards um, who've then said they'd like me to join them on some other board or whatever it is, or would I like to apply for 
something. So just then you have to prove yourself with, um, you know, with actual, you know, the way you work. Um, but I, I think uh, women are actually rather ideal for committees and things because they're quite collegiate. They're consensus builders and they're good listeners. You know, you have to be a listener. You have to, you know, and they have great senses in terms of how is someone feeling about things, putting themselves in other people's shoes, um, which is, you know, if you're going to bring together a consensus, you have to understand who, who's around the board and where, they, where they're going to come from. And I think women have all those great skills. Mm. Um, so I think they're, they're very suitable for board positions. Definitely, definitely. And a um, bit of a change of course, Maggie, but um, I love the phrase that, you know, if you, they have to say if you... If you want something doing, ask a busy woman. And um, I was very intrigued by something I read about you having campaigned for um, this, a statue of um, Licaricia, who was a pioneering businesswoman in the 13th century. I love this story. Can you tell us a bit about that, Maggie? Because I feel like it's just an amazing addendum to everything else you've been up to. Yeah. Because women, in, women as statues is another big kind of topic that, you know, is... There aren't enough of them. In fact, there's hardly any. Um, so great one to add. Can you just tell us a bit about that? Yes. I mean, it just as a general thing, and I think this is something people should think about. I, I have tried to keep something of charity work all the way through my uh, my career. And again, that started with, with the being on board of, a, of an orchestra in my 20s. Um, but I, but I, I think it's really nice to do that. And so... Um, this licorice lady, <laughs> she was um, in, in, I live in Winchester okay. and um, in, the, in, in the 13th century, Winchester had recently been the capital of, of England. And um, so Henry III was, was born there um, and I spent a lot of time in Winchester. And um, at the time there were uh, a number of women bankers, but it <laughs> Um, there was a treasury in Winchester and there were a number of women bankers um, and Licorice was one of them. She raised money for all sorts of buildings, including um, Westminster Abbey. Um, and, and they enabled um, build, building um, on an unprecedented scale. And so the, the whole point of, of her is is not just to say she was an extraordinary woman, which she was, I mean, and there were others extraordinary women beside her, but it's about um, education, it's about learning, um, that there were, um, she was a Jewish woman as well, so, you know, uh, they, the Jews in that time were, were quite heavily persecuted. So it's about learning about the time um, that she lived in, how Winchester was a royal capital, and, um, tolerance and diversity. So the interesting thing about her is that we're not, she's not actually going to be there for us to say she was just a remarkable woman in her own right, but also to learn about the education aspects of Winchester at that time and, 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 and the persecution of her community. So we've got alongside the statue, a book and um, leaflets and a whole education project um, which is, you know, quite a substantial part of it. It's absolutely amazing. So whereabouts is she? If people are in Winchester, whereabouts is she? She's not unveiled yet. Oh, is she not? Oh, right. <laughs> We're still Again. raising the money. Um, <laughs> oh, right. If anybody wants to give money, please do. Um, she, she will be outside the Discovery Centre, which is the Winchester Library. Okay. Um, and she actually lived opposite. Um, amazing. Yes. So it's, it's been a fascinating, a fascinating thing. And we've got the Archbishop of Canterbury and all sorts of people, um, you know, who very kindly supported the project as well as, you know, lots of locals. So yes, it's been terrific. It's amazing. It's such a brilliant string to your bow. It's a story I loved reading about, I have to say. And um, just winding back um, to racing, you're obviously being deeply involved in racing, um, you know, from the start of when you were on more on the media side of things with Channel 4, you know, being involved in Channel 4 racing, and then subsequently you've kind of been well ensconced in the industry, primarily with the RCA. Um, 
it's obviously been quite a challenging year for for racing how are you how do you see the without getting into too many specifics maggie like how do you sort of see the future in the next year or two I've, i already asked the question if you were hopeful about boards but you know do you are you seeing positive are you, do you are you anticipating positivity coming out of covid for us as well well i start with the fact i can't wait to go racing again um <laughs> i'm sure i'm not the only one <laughs> I forget because I'm because I'm on the race course all the time, so I don't have the kind of um, I, f I forget how lucky we are to be going racing actually at yeah. the moment and, and have been for the you last. Do. <laughs> you do. So. <laughs> and so I I, I um, I'm I'm really quite optimistic. I I feel that um, racing is going to provide for people just exactly what they need coming out of COVID. Um, you know, something of, of a place where they can meet their friends and celebrate and have have some real live excitement um so i'm just hoping that my, my first hope is that we can get as many crowds back obviously safely mm -hmm. um you know at, at the right time that was what i hope and then i think people will come back and they'll realize what they've missed and they'll, and they'll, and they'll love it um and, and so you know, I'm hoping we can make the most of that. I think there's another opportunity, which is a little bit of a hidden opportunity, but there's a lot of savings have been made by people. And mm -hmm. I realise that, you know, not every business has, has had it easy um, during this COVID. And so it's a bit of an asymmetric outcome. But um, I understand there's 180 billion of savings being made um, during this COVID uh, time. And I think we ought to try to tap into that to see if we can get some more interest from owners. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah. yeah, I mean, we've all worked hard and together to to get the racing behind closed doors, and we'll do do so again um, to, to to bring these out. And you know, thanks to the RCA team, I have to say, who've worked absolutely like Trojans um, to to try and help people do that. And we will just continue to do it. But I, I'm really, you know, quietly optimistic about the future. Well, that's lovely. That's yeah. lovely. Um, well, hopefully we'll be able to see you on a race course very soon. And I shall look forward to having a glass of something nice with you at some point in the future. Um, just finally, before we come to questions, uh, we have got a few popped up, which is great. If anyone else has any more questions, do pop them in the Q&A. Um, we've got a few in there, which we'll attack in a second. Um, one lovely thing, finally, you were given a CBE in January, Maggie, which congratulations <laughs> from all of us at Women in Racing. Have you had a ceremony? Are you having a ceremony? Have you had a celebration? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think with, I think there's a long queue of people. Obviously, with COVID, there isn't a, there isn't a, you know we've got to wait until um, you know the Queen or whoever it is is going to present it has got time in the diary. I think, and it, and we're, and, and we're, we're able to do it safely. So that's the art. That's a real art. I think. <laughs> well, you are Maggie Carver CBE in name, if not uh, yet with medal. I know, so. right? <laughs> it still feels terribly surreal, but um, <laughs> it, was a, it was a thrilling experience, even unexpected. I mean, when the email came through I thought it was a virus actually <laughs> <laughs> well congratulations we're thrilled for you it's really lovely and and Thank well you. deserved well deserved um few questions um where do you see your career going next you have achieved so much but is there anything else that you want to achieve that's a good question um in some ways, I think that uh, I'd like to be able to use my skills. Um, it sounds very a bit too, um, I don't know, ambitious maybe, but to, but to do some good for society. <laughs> that's that's what I'd really like to do. I, I actually have to keep um, earning, um, so I can't just do it for free. <laughs> um, but I, I, you know, I think my Ofcom role is is one where I feel that. Um, I'm really able to, to, to do that and it's very motivating. Um, so I think I'd like to sort of continue that, maybe, maybe something within uh, in policy as well, um, perhaps in time. Mm, interesting. Yeah, well, we'll watch this space. Yeah, I've done um, so much in the media, I think, you know, just <laughs> to put all of that, you know, away. It's nice to be able to be in a position there where although you obviously still want to be paid for things to be actually able to do things that are associated with your passions and interests, I guess. And, you know, obviously your board roles have reflected that to agree. But as you get, um, you know, further on in your career, it's lovely to be able to kind of really do the things that make you tick, isn't it? Um, yes. Okay, next one is if there is one thing you could advise employers, what would it be? Ooh, that's a big question. Employers. 
It's all about people, isn't it? I think. So um, you've got to choose your people carefully and, and, and well. And then you, having chosen them, you've got to treat them well as well. Because mm -hmm. um, I think any enterprise is all about people. Yeah, I think it was Richard Branson that said, you've got to train your people so well that they can leave and treat them so well that they don't want to. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Definitely good advice. And um, another one, what do you know now that you wished you had known when you've got your first senior appointment? Um, that's quite a tricky one. <laughs> um, I, I mean, the... The answer is, you, as we go along in life, I think we do have experiences that we learn from. And one of the things that um, I, I think I've lived in male and worked in male environments all most of my career. And um, I've been the only woman on the board for most of my career as well. Most of the boards I've been on, I'm the only woman. Um, not quite so much now, but knowing a little bit more about how men behave <laughs> and um, particularly when they're cornered and get quite aggressive would have been quite helpful knowing how to deal with that you have to learn how to deal with that and um, and I think that's a skill I would have quite liked to or, or at least some expectation of that would have been quite helpful mm -hmm. um, rather than having to sort of go through the experience of it because <laughs> actually at 27 that's a young age to be sitting on boards you know and I think naturally everybody grows more confident and probably a bit more assertive with age um and and actually when you're still in your 20s you know I, I it strikes me that you are a very confident person Maggie but even then did you find that tricky when you were when you were first in that position yeah I'll give you an experience I um I had to uh, you know, my French wasn't brilliant, um, so I went through every every word of the board papers um, and translated every single word that I now got to know the French accounts quite well and so forth. But um, so I knew what was coming up and I knew the agenda. But the the French company, um, I was representative of the shareholder, and the French company uh, decided during the board meeting to do something which we didn't want, we wouldn't want, wasn't in our interest, and we were able to block it. But um, I had to stand up and, and say so, um, or at least I had to say so in one way or another. I, I felt my French probably wasn't good enough to get cross in French. <laughs> um, and I, I knew that I really needed to be very assertive. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just decided I'd do it in English. So I literally stood up <laughs> and, I, and I sort of said everything in a very assertive way in English. The, the chief executive, didn't speak any English. So it, it was quite funny because the person next door to him was leaning over and just whispering in his ear to say what I was actually saying. <laughs> so it was a bizarre incident, but it did work, you know, and you, you just have to get up and do it. Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. Well, I think we can all learn from that. And final question before we wrap up, which you, you may not be able to answer in your position as chief of the RCA, what is the first race course that you want to visit when you're allowed? Or is that like choosing a favourite child? <laughs> Do you have a favourite race course, Maggie? I can't say I have a favourite. <laughs> I have lots of favourite race courses for all sorts of different reasons. Um, I, I love them all. I actually love lots of different, I, you know, I really enjoy dressing up, for example, but I also enjoy the winter, you know, the going, I'm, you know, going to winter jumps and with a warm coat on and having a hot cup of cocoa and all the rest of it. So um, I can't say I do have a favorite one. What would I, where would I, but I must say I'm, I am looking, I'm really hoping that I can go to some of the summer courses <laughs> now, that we're, now that we're sort of coming in. I'm, you know, my, my tenure finishes you know, fairly shortly. So I'm just hoping that I can get as much racing in as possible. Well, I'm quite sure that you'll be there for Royal Ascot, Maggie, and um, I will hopefully look forward to seeing you there. Um, thank you so, so much for joining us. This has been really fun and um, yeah, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Maggie.
Um, we will be back again, as I said, next week. If you this this will be available online, and if you do have any burning questions for Maggie that we haven't covered in this interview, just drop us an email at Women in Racing, and we'll try and forward them on to Maggie and see if we can get a response. Um, but yes, thank you so so much for coming and That's for joining cool. us this evening. It's been such a pleasure, and thank you all for joining us in the audience. Um, we really appreciate people who hop online to watch these because it does create a bit of a nicer atmosphere when we have a bit of interaction. So yes, um, good evening and goodbye everybody and we will see you next week. Thank you.